I want to show you something, friends, and if I can find it. I'm reading a book that we're going to talk about in one of our first principles discussions. It's called Surveillance Capitalism. It's written by Shoshana Zuboff, right? It's a complex, difficult book, but it's an excellent book. It's not necessary reading, but we'll talk about it, you know, in several weeks in one of our first principles conversations. But essentially, she's talking about, and I'm going to use this to set our intention. She's talking about the, the basic notion that Google, run by a small group of people, actually, its business is not search. It's not actually making the information of the world available. That was how it started. But by the year 2001, that was no longer its business. Its business is advertising. And what it sells is what are called predictive analysis of what you will do in response to a targeted ad that's targeted particularly and uniquely to you. That's actually Google's business. And Google can often be running three trillion auctions a second. And what's being auctioned is the predictive analysis of your behavior. Wow. I mean, that's, if you've got the implications of what I just said, you should be shocked out of your mind. I'm gonna talk about this in great depth in several weeks. But for now, I just want you to catch the, the shock of that. And that was central. It's central to political campaigns. It's central to you know, this ability to essentially enter into our interior space and essentially steal through artificial intelligence and computer design the predictions of our future, step into our future with ads of every kind to actually directly affect our behavior. And Google, of course, didn't ask permission. This was what Google called the wild, wild west. No one ever thought about it. This was an unprecedented field, and you can't legislate an unprecedented field. Does everyone get that sentence? You can't legislate a field that doesn't exist. Now, here's what I'm interested in, right? Right now, I don't want to go into what this means, what its implications are, how can we change it, why do we need to stand against it. Let's take all that aside. You can't challenge. This is what we're interested in. Shoshana Zuboff desperately wants to challenge Google. And she writes a, just a, a stunning tour de force book. But she can't because she lacks a language of first principles and first values with which to challenge Google. And kind of all through her book, the kind of vague, abstract, you know, liberal notions of personhood or honor are all vague, ill-formed, and not compelling. So Shoshana Zuboff is outraged. She's a professor emeritus at Harvard, correctly so, articulates beautifully the analysis of what Google's doing, but can't actually muster and compel the activism needed to respond. Does everyone get this? It's, it, it's so deep. And she talks about the fact that people are not even shocked by what Google's doing, but what she doesn't understand is that the reason they're not shocked is because they're no longer connected over the last 20 years. We're no longer connected to the set of first principles and first values, which are beyond social constructions of reality. They're beyond the most pragmatic way for us to all get along. We need to be aligned with first principles and first values that are aligned with reality itself right, that are ultimately true, not in a dogmatic sense, not because they're owned by one religion, but because they're aligned with the basic values of cosmos expressed across all platforms. Chris and I had a conversation on Friday with a, a high ranking young man at the Department of Defense in America. Chris, do you remember the conversation? I just actually just got off the phone with him. And I tried to share with him this, and he got it. He was, he was wildly excited, right, about what it would mean to articulate first values and first principles across domains so that we actually had a set of shared values that were far greater than anything which divides us. We have a story which unites us and that story is based on first principles and first values 
that's far greater than anything that divides us. So we begin to be able to articulate a global ethos for a global civilization. Yesterday, I'm just gonna give you one more example. Yesterday, I just talked to another good friend, right? Or was it Friday, perhaps, right? Who's a board member of the Center for Integral Wisdom, which the, the Center for Integral Wisdom is the original think tank out of which spun this many paths, one mountain, out of which Barbara and I started this, this initiative and we're all, we're all engaged now together partnering in this Many Paths, One Mountain. Many Paths, One Mountain is now a, an actual program. We're, we're formally linked with the Foundation for Conscious Evolution, which Barbara founded and I made her a promise that I would continue, right? And so I was talking to one of the board members, right? Um, I'm not gonna say his name, he's a doctor. He's a board member both of the foundation and of the center. And he's been running the Senate campaign, a United States Senate campaign for one of his close friends. And his close friend ostensibly lost the primary, but there's an enormous amount of evidence that actually the, the way the election happened was unfair, right? And that actually the, the machines that actually run the election were stacked and rigged in a particular way. Now that sounds shocking. That sounds like a shocking claim. But actually, it's not. And I trust my friend implicitly, and I trust his. He's an extremely good evidentiary person. And I believe that the facts are correct. Now, tra track this with me for a second, okay? Because this, and we're going to set our intention here. I want to really kind of get this in a deep way. You see, the reason Sergey Brin and Larry Page, who wrote a, who were the, the owners of Google, who wrote a paper in 1998 against advertising, saying that actually the search engine, which organizes the world's information, Google, could not actually get involved in advertising, right? Because it would actually compromise the nature of the searches and the nature of the informational architecture of the world, right? How did they, two or three years later, become essentially surveillance capitalists? Meaning they're not serving the end user. The end user is not the person searching, but they're surveilling. They're actually using police surveillance tactics but much, much more advanced than any police department. They've actually developed an artificial intelligence, machine learning, internally driven algorithms that are able to put together a level of surveillance of you that's shocking and beyond imagination. And they're selling it trillion auctions a second to arbitrary advertisers around the world. What happened? So the answer is, Sergey Brin said in an interview, you know, I felt like a schmuck, quote, end of quote. My company, you know, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna extrapolate now, my company was about to go under. Google, when the dot-com bust happened in 2000, 2001, Google would have gone under. Google was pressured by win-lose metrics, success story, venture capitalists, two firms in particular, to actually deliver an immediate short-term profit or to go under. And Bryn and Page, educated, raised, fed, suffused with the need to succeed short-term in the win-lose metrics success story, succumb, and they actually created one of, not one of, right, the most fundamentally corrupt structure of its kind and magnitude in human history, whose potential negative implications, I'm not gonna go into now, are beyond imagination. So in other words, the fact that they didn't have a larger story of duty, of honor, a story of honor, right? A story of obligation, a story of joy and responsibility, a story of eros, right? A story of what it means to be a hero, an early adopter of homo amor, as Christina Tehel recapitulated so gorgeously. All they had was the win-lose metrics. Wow, wow. Same thing with the election that my friend's friend was running for US Senate, right? The win-lose metrics, right, overtook everything else. And we said a couple of weeks ago, and it's profoundly true and I wanna get it. Right? One of the reasons people are so furious in the liberal world with President Trump is because, right, and by, just to be clear, right, I'm not a big fan of Joe Biden, but I'm going to register and vote for Joe Biden. Right? Given the entire reality today, I think that's an essential moral imperative. Right, just I want to kind of make that clear. Having said that, the, the, 
the part of the anger at Trump is that he says the unspeakable, right? And he says, wow, those, those soldiers, they were losers. You're not allowed to say that a soldier was a loser. You can't say that. But actually, Trump is expressing the darkest shadow of the win-lose metrics of American society. And as we said two weeks ago, Trump was put into office by the liberal left media voting for him, not with their votes, but with their coverage. He was covered right, enormously because he took most of the liberal left media, print and online, out of bankruptcy, out of the red and into the black. So he got covered disproportionately because everyone looked at the win-lose metrics and not at the larger good. I mean, that's shocking, friends. We need first principles. We need first values. And it's not, if you're here to do this in a week or two, we're going to be here every week. We've been, you know, as long as, as God gives us breath and strength, right? We're in our 200 and what week, Christina, to hell? We're in our 205th week, sixth week, something like that. My guess is it's going to take us 205. My guess is it's going to take us another five, six years to really articulate and get down these first principles and first values. And we're here every week to come together to do that. We're here to play a larger game. All right, we're not here for a win-lose metrics. We're not here to evaluate how many likes we have. All right, we're here to actually be aligned with the joy and responsibility of Cosmos. We're here to participate in the eros of Cosmos. So I have a question for you as we set our intention. Are y'all, anyone up for a question? Who's up for a question? Who's up for a question? Anybody? Anybody up for a question? Are we up for a question? Who's up for a question? Are we ready? Are we ready to play a larger game? Are we ready to play a larger game? Are we ready to participate in the evolution of love? But I just wanna deepen to really get this and have this kind of conversation, really get this deeply, okay? Right, as I said, as I said earlier, right, and, and we don't do, right, the notion that there's no politics in church is absurd. Politics is polis. polis. Politics is the evolution of love, right? Politics is right, how we create a better society. So I want to get this, and I want to get it kind of really, really deeply in a, in a really profound way. What does it mean to be a hero, right? What does it mean to lay down your life for your country? Okay, I want to try and find this for a second. So we get actually the, 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 the terribleness, right? The sadness, the grotesqueness, right? Of, of actually what happened, right? With President Trump and his remarks about, about heroes and servicemen. It's really, really important to get it deeply. We said last week that heroes are early adopters of homo amor. Okay, and stay with this, everyone. So I'm going to want to get it in the chat box. Okay, see if everyone can get it in the chat box. Heroes are early adopters of Homo Amor. Does everyone get that? Now, to be a hero means you're willing to give up your life for something larger than yourself, or you're willing to endanger your life, right, for something larger than yourself. That's what it means. That's the core of the whole thing. Now, if you live in a win-lose metrics of a separate self, you live in a separate self, win-lose metrics, what does that mean? That means ultimately there is nothing larger than yourself. That's the whole point. That's what Trump exactly didn't understand. But what he's doing is he's amplifying, and to really get this takes subtlety, it takes depth. He's amplifying the win-lose metrics that's already in the space, right? That's exactly the point. In other words, we had a couple of thousand years of this sense of there being larger honor, larger goodness, larger values for which we were willing to make an ultimate sacrifice. Now, often those larger values were corrupt. They were, the idea of larger value was hijacked by a pope or by a king or by a government. That's absolutely true. But the very notion that I live as part of a larger frame of value is everything. And the notion that it's not over when I die, 
that there's a larger frame than death, that death is a night between two days, and that the notion of eternity that actually lives inside of me and the connection to the larger field of value actually lives inside of me, that's what allows me to be a hero. Now, if I lose that connection, if I actually experience myself as a separate self in a win-lose metric success story, it's a very small step to actually doing what Trump did, which is essentially desecrating the hero. But what does it mean to desecrate the hero? Go deep with me. What does it mean? What does the word desecrate? Anyone get the word desecrate? What does the word desecrate mean? Can anyone grab that word in the chat box? Desecrate, desecrate, but get the word. Desecrate means to lose the sacred, desecrate. To desecrate means I've lost the sacred, meaning I've lost the larger field of value. And it only makes a sense to be a hero in a larger field of value. And so what happens is Trump actually is the grotesque expression of something that's deeper. And it's not there's one evil man. No, yes, Trump is enormously, enormously problematic. And yes, he should be voted out of office. That's a given. But it's not about one evil man. It's about this man expressing right, a larger field, but amplifying it in a grotesque way. Does everyone get that? Who gets that? How many people get that? How many people get it? It's deep. Right, it's deep, right? How many, yes, yes. How many other yeses, right? Just to feel that, right? To feel that together, right? So what we need to do is, right? In other words, handling Osama bin Laden, right? Who took down the World Trade Center, right? He, he, needed, to be, he needed to be handled, right? And engaged, right? And it, it's not, you can't take down a World Trade Center without having an appropriate response, right? It means the United States killed him. That was an, an appropriate response. A pacifist response was the wrong response. Voting Donald Trump out of office, right, is obviously needs to be done. But you can't actually just kill Osama bin Laden or vote Trump out of office. That's not going to get us home. Right? What's going to get us home is articulating a larger field of value in which we participate. And not per se dying for the larger field, but living for the larger field. And when necessary, being willing to land on the beaches of Normandy, right? And, 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 and give up my narrow separate self life for the sake of a larger value, right? All of us, every single person who's on this call, right? Is on this call because some other, sometimes woman, often man in battle, right? Gave up their life for a larger field of value. That's why we're here. That's a huge, that's huge. So the desecration of the hero, right, is the desecration of the larger field of value. And the hero feels the larger field of value even before the rest of us do, right? So Trump is the anti-hero in the story, the anti-homo amor, and the hero is the early adopter of homo amor. Do you get that? Right? The hero understands the larger field of value. 